and um, off my email. Okay. Thank you again, everyone, for attending this session. Um, it's my true honor to introduce two wonderful plenary speakers today, uh, Professor Carl Mayton and Dr. Jagan Jordan. Uh, Jordan. Uh, Professor Mayton is Professor of Sociology at the University of Sydney. He is also the director of the Le Legitimation Co-Theory Center for Analytic Building, and he is a visiting professor at Rose University and the University of the Whisperance in South Africa. Professor Maitans is the creator of legitimation code theory, uh, which is being uh, widely used to shape research and practice in education, sociology, and linguistics. He has published a number of books, and the more recent include Knowledge and Knowers in 2014, uh, Knowledge Building in 2016, Assessing Academic Discourse in 2020, and study uh, in science um, this year in 2021. And the last two are collection bringing together cutting ideas from legitimation code theory and systemic functional linguistics. For those of you who are interested in LCT, please visit the website um, of the LCT Center uh, and find out more. Dr. Uh, Jagan Doran is a researcher at the University of Sydney and is now an academic at the Australian Catholic University. Uh, his focus, uh, his research focuses on language, semiosis, knowledge, and education, uh, spanning the interdisciplinary fields of educational linguistics, multimodality, and language and identity. He was primarily on English and Sundanese, and from the verbosity of systemic functional linguistics and legitimation co theory. And he has also published a number of books, including The Disco of Physics, Building Knowledge Through Language, Mathematics, and Imagery. Uh, it was published by Raleigh Edison and Aiting. And he also an editor of Assessing Academic Disco in 2020 by Raleigh and Studying Science uh, this year in 2021, which uh, bring together ideas from systemic functional linguistics and legitimation co theory. And we are truly fortunate to have two experts in ICT here with us to um, uh, deliver their very speech uh, today. Thank you very much. First, yeah, thank you, um, Vin. First, thanks to uh, Vin for inviting us and for making this event happen. I mean, it's a great achievement. It's a lot of work. Um, so thank you so much for for doing that and for inviting us to give a talk. Today, I'm, what we're going to do is to discuss uh, constellations and explanations, which is work um, done by um, Jaegen Doran and myself, and Jaegen's here. Uh, I'll be speaking, but this is a completely, um, I'll be speaking mostly until there are hard questions, and then I'll just throw them to Jaegen. Um, but, <laughs> but uh, it's a completely collaborative paper. Um, before I begin uh, into, the, into the, the main part, I need to let you know three things to start with, which is um, firstly, hang on, here we go. Firstly, um, you can read the full version of this paper in a book called Teaching Science, which came out this year, editing, edited by myself, Jim Martin and Jagenton. And uh, this book has also got new work by Jim uh, Martin and Jing Hao and Yegan and others that um, I, I think will revolutionize uh, SFL. So buy it now and get a copy for all your friends and family for Christmas um, or Hanukkah or whatever you want, want to buy it for. Secondly, um, this talk is about legitimation code theory um, it's not uh, SFL. Um, we're here. As, well, Jagan's uh, 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 very much an expert in SFL. But we're doing this paper on LCT because there's a lot of great work using SFL and LCT together to make sense of social practices in all sorts of arenas, um, such as education and law and the media and so on. And you can find this work, as Vin said, you can find this work on the LCT website, 
Uh, but the book Accessing Academic Discourse um, is also a good place to start um, if you're interested in work that brings these things together. And third, my third point uh, before I get into the crux of everything is, um, is that we're going to, uh, this paper is going to just discuss uh, complex explanations and how they're taught in science education, but the analysis will be as simple as possible. We'll make a few very simple distinctions in order to try and make a very simple argument. And that argument is that relations among ideas matter. Or more precisely, that relations among ideas in scientific explanations may shape how to teach those explanations. As I said, I'm not doing, uh, we're not doing SFL in this paper, so I won't be trying to label. Um, so we're not going to try and label every possible type of relation among ideas that can be found. What we're going to do is use constellation analysis from LCT to explain why different kinds of explanations in science education may be taught differently. And we're going to do that in three main parts. Firstly, a brief introduction to constellation analysis. And then two examples. We'll use those ideas to analyze an explanation of tides. And then we'll look at an explanation of uh, why the Earth has seasons. Now, I don't have uh, time today to discuss um, existing ways of analysing science education in the field of science education research or the work uh, on science education that's being done and has been done for quite some time in SFL. We're going to jump straight into introducing the concepts that we're going to use in the rest of the paper. And to do that, we'll start with uh, an analogy where you start with the idea of constellations in astronomy. Now, and this is a useful way uh, to these ideas. So in astronomy, a uh, constellation refers to a grouping of stars that make an imaginary picture in the sky. So if you look at the night sky um, when it's clear, you can see an enormous number of stars if you're not in a city. So for example, here uh, on the left here, there's um, uh, a tiny portion of the sky is being um, show, depicted, showing some of the stars. Now with that possible set, a small number uh, have then get, uh, become selected over time to become part of the constellation of Taurus, as it's known. And they're arranged into a pattern shown by the lines on the side there. And as well as being constellated in this way, although there also might be, by the way, smaller clusters inside a constellation. So for example, and you can see it on the slide, um, Pleiades is a cluster of stars within Taurus. And as well as being constellated, stars can also be, these arrangements of stars, these constellations can also be condensed with meaning. So for example, the ancient Mesopotamians described Taurus as the great bull of heaven. And then meanings can also be charged positively, neutrally, or negatively. So for example, in modern astrology, Taurus signals a variety of attributes, such as creativity, affectionate, grasping, so not all positive. Now this selection arrangement, the meanings given, and the valuation of constellations may vary across contexts and change over time. So for example, some stars are visible only from certain places. Those known as the Southern Cross are a notable example. And they also show how this can change over time because those stars were actually visible in the Northern Hemisphere until the fifth century. Another thing that can vary and change is the meanings they're given. So for example, the Zuni people of New Mexico called the Pleiades Cluster, they called it, sleep, they called it seed stars because their position was traditionally used to determine the time of year to plant seeds. It's also the logo of the car maker Subaru, whose um, advertising tries to condense that uh, cluster with uh, that set of star, that logo with notions like reliability. So, okay, there's always limits to any analogy, but that does introduce some of the key terms. Cluster, which is a grouping of nodes. So stars are usually called nodes. Nodes, a grouping of nodes. Um, constellation, which is a larger grouping of nodes that might include clusters. 
Condensation is how nodes and clusters and constellations are imbued with meanings of various kinds. Charging describes the valuation given to those nodes and clusters and constellations. And the last one is cosmology. Uh, that refers to the organizing principles underlying and shaping the selection, the arrangement, and the valuation of nodes in a constellation. And we get that cosmology by analyzing legitimation codes. So that brings us into the heart of legitimation code theory. Okay, so that's a really abstract set of definitions um, and they're deliberate. These concepts can be used to look at all kinds of practices, not just scientific ideas. You can use them to look at uh, political ideologies. Um, you can um, you look at religious beliefs. Um, Movements in dance, sounds in music, athletic moves, and, and so on. So nodes, they might be not, they might not just be ideas, they might be institutions, they might be people, they might be body movements or sounds or machine parts or players uh, from a squad put onto a pitch and arranged into a into a team. You can also uh, so what these refer to can be all sorts of things. And they, the, the, these, these concepts can be used to analyze uh, social practices in a variety of different ways. Here, we're going to only use uh, two of the concepts, clusters and constellations, because we wanted to understand, Jägen and I wanted to understand why different scientific explanations were taught differently. So our focus was on how relations among ideas matter. We weren't focusing here in this analysis on the kinds of meanings being related together, which is shown by condensation, or how they might be valued in different ways, epistemologically, axiologically, in other ways, which is the, the domain of charging. And we weren't analyzing how the constellations were created and generated and maintained, reproduced and changed. Uh, the, we weren't analyzing the basis of all that, which is cosmology. I'm always saying that you only need as much theory as the problem demands, and those two are all that's needed right now. And to do that as simply as we could, we also made three simple distinctions that helped us understand uh, the examples we analyzed. Now, these are not some sort of map of different relations of ideas. They're just simply the minimum distinctions that we needed to make in order to make sense of the examples of teaching that we'll be discussing through this paper. And they are, so these are three distinctions. First one is the kinds of links made between, I'm gonna say ideas from now on, or nodes. Um, so it's the kind of links, and there are all kinds of links, but we made a simple distinction between independent link, links where meanings of a node or a cluster are independent of other nodes or clusters in that constellation. So for example, we'll be working through an explanation of the tides very soon. And one idea in that explanation, one part, one node is the, the idea that the earth is divided into water and solid components. Now, all ideas rely on other ideas to make sense as language or as knowledge. And in science, ideas often depend on things already discussed, such as previous teaching about the earth. But when we talk about independent links, we're talking about whether something put forward in an explanation relies on other ideas in that constellation, in the, the explanation being analyzed. And water and solid and so on do not appear separately in the explanation of the times that we're gonna be analyzing. It's just stated. So it's not dependent on other things in that constellation. And in contrast, dependent links are there where nodes or clusters are uh, dependent on other things, other nodes or clusters in that constellation. So for example, in the quote that you see on the slide, I've put in bold, um, it brings together two nodes that are in bold. It brings together, in fact, it says bringing together that the earth is divided into water and solid components, which is gonna be one of our um, nodes we'll, you'll see soon. And it brings together that with the moon has gravity, which is stronger the closer things are to it. And then it draws out the implications of those two. So it depends on those nodes inside the constellation. So that's the first, distinction we're going to be making, and you'll see it over and over again um, as we go through. A second distinction, a very simple one, is between a base cluster and a supplementary cluster. So what we mean by this, and again, you'll see in action through the talk, 
is um, is the difference between what's put forward as a sort of the smallest set of ideas that can create a basic version of the constellation. That's the base cluster. It's the smallest number of things that you need to, to kind of get to where this is supposed to be going. And then supplementary clusters are ones that are put forward, constructed, or as they like to say in SFO, construed as things that are elaborating or refining or developing or building off of in some way, shape or form, unpacking, for example, that base cluster. So again, this is going to become obvious in our examples. And by the way, I'll apologize if you can start hearing barking in a minute. One of my dogs is going absolutely insane behind me. Vincent, come here. You are now going to get on YouTube. Um, they become obvious in our examples, but it's how uh, the point to make is that it's how it's put forward inside the constellation or the explanation in our, in our focus. And lastly, another simple distinction, between two ways of building constellations over time. Assembling, where nodes and clusters are kind of built in a sort of linear and incremental way, and aggregating, in which nodes and clusters are sort of set out separately, built up, and then brought together. Again, you'll see what I mean as we go through. Now, of course, as I've said, they're not the only kinds of relations among ideas that can be found, um, but they're all we need to make sense of what we're going to analyze. And what we're going to analyze are uh, scientific explanations of the tides and the seasons. And we chose these two because they share a lot in common uh, amongst the things that we were analysing. They're both core topics in year seven of secondary school science in New South Wales, Australia, um, which is uh, what our project was on. They both concern widely known phenomena in the natural world, and they both can seem uh, simple. Water reaches higher and lower through the day, tides, uh, the temperature goes up and down, goes higher and lower over the year, seasons. But they are anything but simple. They both involve complex constellations of empirical phenomena, and they are very different. Uh, they bring our ideas together in different ways. And we're going to look at them in two ways. First, we're going to create each one of these. We're going to look at it in two ways. We're going to create what we call a schematic constellation of the logic of the explanation as a whole that was compiled from five, the big five major textbooks aimed at year seven secondary school science in New South Wales, Australia, for which um, we did a synchronic analysis of the key nodes and relations among them, among them that the explanations involve. So this is not, and you'll see what I mean, but this does, it's not, it does not show how that an explanation unfolds through a text. It's a sort of synoptic snapshot of the logic of the explanation. It's like, it's like a subway map. It's like a map of the underground. It doesn't tell you anything about a journey, a specific journey. It just shows you what stations there are and how they're connected. And then what we did was we looked at how the constellations of the explanations were put forward in a specific science classroom, which is more looking at something Looking at a particular, like uh, looking at a particular journey through the subway map, we started then to try and see what stations does the teacher go to, and how does she go through them. And spoiler alert: this is what we're going to argue, which is that the schematic constellation, the logic, as it were, of the explanation of tides, is simpler and lends itself to teaching that uses assembly to build the explanation. It lends itself to a simple explanation being put forward first that is then elaborated, and then that elaboration is further elaborated in a very linear way. And in contrast, the schematic constellation, the logic of the explanation um, for seasons is much more complex and offers different ways of reaching its conclusion. And this, we suggest, lends itself to a far less linear way of teaching that explanation. Different ideas can be brought together in a variety of ways. And so from this, um, our results in conjecture will be that this might show how the logic might affect the pedagogy. That is, um, we might be able to see how the, uh, the, the ideas and the ways, the relations among them in, for example, a curriculum or the recontextualizing field, as it's called, might shape the way they are, um, they are then recontextualized into teaching and learning. So the logic explanation may shape the logic of the pedagogy, the way in which they're taught. And you'll see what I mean. Right, from 
analyses of explanations of tides in five the five major textbooks, we de developed a composite of their keynotes. And uh, we'll begin by summarizing these notes. This is in our own words. Um, I'll read it out because the analysis will then be easier to follow. Uh, and the words in bold will appear in the diagrams that we'll be using. So here we go. I'm going to read this out. A. These are the, the key ideas and how, uh, uh, in explaining tides. So A, the Earth is divided into water and solid components. B, the moon has gravity, which is stronger the closer things are to the moon. C, together, that node A, water and solid, and node B, moon's gravity, mean that the moon's gravitational pull is strongest for the water on the Earth closest to the moon, less strong for the Earth solid, and weakest for the water on the Earth furthest from the moon. D, Node C, that previous one, produces bulges of water on the parts of the Earth that are closest and furthest away from the Moon, which we experience as high tides, and no bulges on the parts of the Earth that are neither closest nor furthest, which we experience as low tides. Okay, following me so far, I hope. Right, continue. I hope. E, the Earth rotates. F, Earth's rotation combined with the bulges of water created by the moon's gravity, leads to the experience of daily variation of tides as the Earth moves through the bulges. G, the moon orbits the Earth. H, the sun's gravity pulls on the water and solid components of the Earth. And I, combining the moon's orbit of the Earth and the sun's gravitational pull with the daily variation of tides, leads to variation in the size of tides. When the moon and uh, sun and moon line up, the tides vary the most. So you get highest highs and the lowest lows, which are known as the spring tide. And when the sun and moon are perpendicular, the tides vary the least with the lowest highs and the highest lows, which is known as the neat tide. Okay, that's a basic, uh, that's the explanation of the tides. So if nothing else, by the way, you're going to come away from this talk hopefully knowing something about, or at least year seven level understanding of the tides and the seasons. Okay, so to show relations among these ideas, we can draw this as a constellation diagram. This can be done in a number of different ways. This isn't the only way of doing it. Um, what we've done here is we've put the nodes which generate independent links in squares and the nodes which generate dependent links in circles. And you can see the dependent links are also shown by lines with arrows that indicate the direction of implication. So we can see that in terms of links, this constellation is characterized by both independent and dependent relations among um, nodes. And it begins with two nodes that establish independent links, the squares. They're just stated, basically. The Earth being water and solid and moon's gravity are not dependent on any other nodes in this explanation. In contrast, how the moon's pull affects the Earth involves the implications of bringing those two together. So it involves dependent links with those two, as shown by the arrow. In turn, high and low tides are the implication of the moon's pull for creating bulges of water. And this is where we reach the notion of tides, the minimum number of things you need to reach the notion of tides in the year seven textbooks. Next. Next comes the fact that the Earth rotates. That's independent, not dependent on anything so far. And it's brought together with how, uh, with the, um, uh, the high and low tides to explain daily variation of tides, which produces a dependent link. So it brings those two together and says that creates, uh, that leads to daily variation. And then to that is added that the moon orbits the earth and the sun has gravity and the implications of all those three are brought together as the notion of spring and neat tides. So we've got dependent links to those three nodes. Okay, so in terms of links, we have a series of independent nodes, Vincent, we have a series of independent nodes, which are squares, which establish factors or phenomena that serve the explanation. They're gonna be used in the explanation. Then we have these dependent nodes, these circles, that relate those phenomena together to create an explanation. So our first very simple point is that relations among parts of the explanation are not all the same. The seemingly simple um, phenomenon of tides um, actually involves a complex series of factors related in different ways. And in terms of clusters, it has a base and two supplementary clusters. The first four nodes were a base cluster that created a basic explanation of tides. Put another way, these are all the nodes that, 
that all the textbooks included in order to reach the idea of tides. And then there are these two supplementary clusters that are successive, by which we mean that each takes, each progresses from a logically preceding node. The first elaborates on high and low to get to the idea of daily variation. And the second elaborates further on that to get to spring and mean time. So in terms of its forms of sort of how it's putting together these things and the logic, um, this doesn't, we don't show that in this. The schematic constellation doesn't show how an explanation unfolds, as I've said. It's not an account of how things are laid out in textbooks. It simply describes the logic of the explanation they put forward. What it does reveal is that the logical relations within the explanation are relatively linear. The simple explanation created by the base structure is augmented, it's elaborated by the implications of adding new independent nodes. And if we add this, this also means that. If we add this, it also means this. Why this matters will become clear when we look at how the seasons is explained. Now, how was that taught? Let's have a look at how that was taught in this lesson that we were studying in depth. So here we're drawing on a lesson from year seven of secondary school, New South Wales, Australia. It's a unit on earth and space sciences that explores such topics as day and night, the seasons and the tides. And we focus on a lesson phase in which a video about tides is shown by the teacher and then she works through the explanation herself. For reasons of time, we're not gonna focus, we're gonna focus entirely on the video as basically her teaching echoes it closely. I uh, apologize for some of the long quotes I'm gonna use, but I wanna take you through all the stages. So in the video, an astronomer explains the, uh, the astronomer explains the causes of tides. Um, uh, it begins with a statement over an animation, and it begins with a statement that summarizes several key factors. Tides are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun and the rotation of the earth. The earth is not a solid sphere like we think. It's actually kind of squishy, especially this layer of water we have on the outside, the oceans. And that's accompanied by an animation showing the moon orbiting the earth. So it begins by highlighting the, moon, uh, the moon's gravity, the Earth's composition um, as uh, water and solid components, uh, the fact that the Earth rotates, the moon's orbit and the sun's gravity. It sets out all the independent nodes that serve the explanation. And then it begins, the video then begins creating dependent nodes to link those together. First, it links the sun's gravity and the moon's gravity with the water and solid of the Earth to explain that the oceans are pulled into bulges. It says, so the gravity of the sun and the moon actually kind of squeeze or stretch the Earth and its oceans out into a couple of bulges, one under the moon, one on the other side of the Earth. And that's spoken over an animation that shows bulges of those parts of the Earth closest to and furthest from the moon, so showing the moon's pull. It then continues, and as the Earth rotates over the course of the day, you, standing on the surface of the Earth, move along with the Earth's surface into these bulges, and we experience that as the rising and lowering tides. So it gets to lie high and low tides. In other words, the video quickly recreates a base cluster mirroring that of the schematic constellation with two differences. Firstly, the sun's gravity is mentioned here, which it, uh, doesn't need to be at this stage, but according to the schematic uh, constellation. But the animation doesn't actually include the sun and its role is not discussed. And secondly, a key attribute of the moon's gravity, that it is stronger the closer the things are to the moon, hasn't been mentioned. So yet, so it doesn't explain why bulges occur on the moon, but that's what it does. Thank you. But that's why it does next, being helped by my dog, one of my dogs. That's what it does next. It brings in this key aspect. It says, now it's easy to see on, on the side facing the moon or the sun, you can get this bulge of ocean. You can imagine the gravity pulling the oceans up into a bulb or a bubble, but it's not as easy to understand why there's a bulge on the other side as well. And the easiest way to describe that is the moon's gravity is stronger, of course, the closer you get to it. So on the side of the moon, close to the moon, the moon is the stronger pull. So while the oceans on the moon's side get pulled more strongly than the general Earth does, on the other side, it's kind of opposite. The pull on the oceans on the far side are less than the pull on the Earth. Think of it as the ocean being, the Earth being pulled out from under the oceans a little bit. So basically we've got the base cluster and then the video elaborates on this twice. It says you get two high dives a day because as the Earth rotates, we rotate through these two bus, uh, bulges. So this links everything so far with the Earth's rotation to describe implications for daily variations of tides. And then it creates the second supplementary cluster showing the role of the sun's gravity in the animation. While the voiceover says this, both the earth and the sun play a role part in tides, each one pulls and so on and so on. So basically it gets in here to uh, the notion of spring tides and it explains neat tides as well. So it basically gets there. This, that ends the video's explanation. It completes this constellation 
and the teacher then works through the explanation in the same way, which we don't have time to discuss here and don't need to. So in basically here, the pedagogic constellation contains the same notes, the same uh, links and the same clusters as the schematic one of the textbooks. And then they are put forward in this assembling kind of way. This, uh, the, all the independent nodes are introduced. Some are then uh, selected to create a base cluster or simple explanation. And then more independent nodes added to the supplementary clusters to elaborate, to elaborate. It's very linear, it's very incremental. Now that's really, really dull and boring. Um, but if you wake up and listen to what happens in our second example, you'll then see why it becomes interesting. Because now we're gonna get to something a little bit more complex. So we're going to do the same thing as before, but for Earth's seasons. So we're going to begin with the schematic constellation from the textbooks, showing the logic. Um, and then we're going to see how a teacher taught, which is going to be very different. Right. I'm going to introduce the Earth's, why the Earth has seasons. And you're going to have to bear with me. There's a lot parts to it, but then it will make sense of everything that comes. Through. OK, so here we go. Let's buckle up. A, the Earth is tilted on its axis at a degree of 23.4 degrees. B, the Earth is divided into northern and southern hemisphere. C, the Earth orbits the sun. D, the Earth's tilt, division into hemispheres, and orbit of the sun together mean that the Earth's northern and southern hemispheres point towards or away from the sun at different times of the year. A, the Earth receives solar energy from the sun's rays. F, the hemispheres point towards or away from the sun, and that the Earth receives solar energy from the sun mean that sunlight hits, hits each hemisphere at different angles through the year. When a hemisphere is pointing towards the sun, the angles of its rays are more direct. And when a hemisphere is pointing away from the sun, the angle of its rays are less direct. G, different angles of sunlight, means that the concentration of light changes in each hemisphere through the year. When a hemisphere is pointing towards the sun, the more direct sunlight it receives is concentrated in a smaller area. And when a hemisphere is pointing away from the sun, the less direct sunlight it receives is concentrated in a larger area. H, differences in concentration of sunlight, we've just had, means that the amount of heat radiation in each hemisphere varies through the year. One more slide. It's complex, this one. I, the Earth rotates. J, that hemispheres point towards or away from the sun. Uh, the Earth receives solar energy and the Earth rotates together, meaning that different parts of the Earth experience different lengths of daylight at different times of the year. And K, variations in heat radiation and or daylight length leads to variations in temperature in each hemisphere through the year that are called seasons. This can also be put more simply as that hemispheres point towards or away from the sun leads to variation in temperature in each hemisphere through the year that are called seasons. Okay, you made it, you got through the seasons. Now, this is the explanation as a, schem uh, a schematic constellation. Now, if we look at the links, it's the same as the tides uh, explanation, having nodes that generate both independent thing, uh, relations, that's the squares, and dependent relations, that's the circles, okay? So for example, it begins with three independent nodes, uh, still hemispheres, orbit, and then they're brought together to give the fact that hemispheres point towards or away from the sun through the year. And then we can go straight from here to seasons. That's that big, long dotted line. Straight through, there you go, straight through to seasons. Textbooks can go from the hemispheres pointing towards or away from the sun to variations in temperature called seasons. So there's a kind of base cluster there. So far, not very different. But this is where it gets interest, interesting. Instead of the base cluster that then they add more information and it's elaborated and then more and then elaborated and so on. This constellation offers two routes through. One route begins with the implication of bringing together towards or away with solar energy for changes in the angle of sunlight received by hemispheres through the year. And then you can elaborate on that if you wish with further dependent nodes that describe implications for changes in concentration of sunlight, changes in heat radiation, and then you get to the variations in temperature for seasons. And a second route brings together towards or away and solar energy with the fact that the earth rotates and brings out the implications for angles uh, in the length of, hang on a second, I've lost my second, yeah, the length of daylight through the year. And then that can reach us, then that reaches towards variations in temperature towards seasons. So like the first explanation, this involves independent nodes that establish factors or phenomena that serve the explanation, and then dependent nodes that draw out the implications of bringing those things together. 
to create an explanation, but it's different in terms of its overall logic. It offers alternative routes to reach seasons. And in each route, the supplementary clusters don't so much elaborate on what's come before as unpack. They unpack the implications of hemispheres pointing towards or away from the sun's creating seasons. So they take that big long arrow, that big long arrow there, that base cluster arrow, they take that and they unpack it in different ways. They say you can unpack it this way, you can unpack it this way. Put another way, where the supplementary clusters for tides and new destinations along one route, we're going to go here, now we're going to go here, now we're going to go here. Those for seasons clarify and deepen an existing um, relation. They add new routes to the same destination. They show the complexity latent within this link between towards your way and seasons. Okay, so what does this all mean for how it gets taught? Uh, let's have a look at the explanation of how the explanations of the seasons are unfolded in the classroom. So the example we're going to discuss is a lesson on seasons in the same year seven secondary school classroom, the same teacher. And in fact, it immediately precedes the lesson on times. And the teacher begins by um, the, the teacher begins by uh, discussing uh, the seasons, uh, um, by discussing how complex it is how complex that constellation is, something she doesn't do for time. So she does this by showing how ripe this explanation is for misunderstanding. She plays a Vox Pop video that people who just ask questions on the street. She shows one of these videos in which adults on the street are asked about the causes of seasons and they give all sorts of mistaken beliefs like saying, oh, the seasons are caused by the equator, the seasons are caused by changing distance from the sun and things like that. And the teacher states this means, quote, you have to think carefully about what we're doing. And this complexity is then reflected in the number of times she takes the task on different routes through this constellation. So in, part, in contrast to the linear unfolding of tides, she builds this constellation of meanings to explain the seasons over and over again in different ways. Specifically, she takes the route, uh, class through a daylight length route, a sunlight angle route, a base cluster route, and then a composite using parts of all those previous three. These routes are clearly separated, by the way, uh, because there's, in between each one, there's class discussions that are not woven into explaining the seasons. There's discussions of other ideas, such as the names of the longest and shortest days of the year, and student questions about things like whether leap years affect the Earth's orbit. So I'm going to go through each one of these briefly. We're going to use this. We'll use the schematic of constellation as a way of mapping the teaching um, to give us the, so we can see how the logic works. Um, whether it's got the same nodes, whether it's got the same kind of links and so on. Okay, I should mention, by the way, that this analysis of ours covered a whole hour of lesson time. So I'm going to be going through this at quite some speed. Okay, so the teacher begins from uh, where the previous uh, lesson ended. The days are longer in summer and shorter in winter. And she elaborates that when days are longer, there is more, this is the first explanation. There is more time for the sun to heat the earth, which means that the temperature is warmer. Temperature is warmer. The student asks students, the teacher asks students why we have longer and shorter days, and she gets a student answer of tilt, and she expands on that. Depending on which part is tilted closer to the sun will determine uh, which, will, which will have longer and shorter days. So in terms of how we can map it, looking at the schematic constellation, the teacher begins with the effects outlined as daylight length and seasons. And then she refers to, uh, she actually refers then to next to an experiment students conducted in a recent lesson, lesson that involved heating a wooden block with a lamp to model the effects of the sun's rays on the earth. So that then brings in, she brings in solar energy and she then asks, why do we have some long days and some short days? And a student answers, because the earth is, tilts, is tilted. And she responds, good. So it's got to do with the tilt of the earth and depending on which part is tilted close to the sun will determine which has longer and shorter days. So as we've seen, um, the diagram I'm using here, as I said, shows ideas and relations among ideas rather than sequencing. But we can see that this is a simple daylight um, length route through the explanation. So she's brought these things together and she's taken them through that particular route, as it were. So she hasn't involved um, uh, the Earth's orbit at this stage. She's only used some of them, by the way, not everything's involved here and she hasn't brought in that the Earth's rotating. So it's kind of a simple version of the daylight route. And then next, she takes them on another route. 
uh, and another activity, another phase. The teacher shows an animation called What Causes Earth Seasons, muting the sound, and she adds her own commentary. And um, uh, I'll just read out what she says, and you can see on the slide in brackets, we've uh, annotated this with the notes um, from the constellation. So she says, what we're looking at here, and she's pointing to the animation, is obviously the Earth spinning on its axis. And you can see that that axis is about 23.5 degrees from what could be the theoretical medline of the Earth. We know that that axis holds itself. Now, when the sun's rays hits the Earth, the Earth has also that other theoretical midline, the equator, that breaks it into half, northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. We're in the southern hemisphere, and at some times the sunlight will strike, in this case, the southern hemisphere at that 90 degree angle. And here, this is what we call an oblique, she's pointing or glancing. So that she mentions the first, she mentions the first um, that node Earth rotates but it's not actually part of the explanation. So the rest, Earth's tilt, solar energy, hemispheres, sunlight angle, all being introduced as factors to, related, be, to be related. So she's bringing those in and then she brings them together while, we were watching, while they're watching an animation. She says, now when this moves around the sun and holds its axis because it doesn't, the axis won't change around like that. When this moves to the other side of the sun, we will see the other side of the earth. Now we're, she's basically talking through what's going on in the animation. She's saying we've got spring, we've got autumn, and now we're on the opposite side. Now the northern, northern hemisphere has summer, southern hemisphere has winter, and so on and so on. And then she sums up this explanation with a slide showing the earth with the equator and the axis shown, the sun and its rays hitting the earth. And she says, so we know the sun is hitting the earth. We know that some parts of the earth will be getting the full force and some will be getting those glancing rays. And then she emphasizes that the thing that will change is our position in relationship to the sun. So basically, she's taken us through a sunlight, sorry, I should jump to that. She's taken us through a sunlight angle route to the explanation. Come here, Vincent. <laughs> she was not having to teach with a very insane border collie going absolutely nuts. <laughs> So there's two. She's already done two routes through this. The third route begins with the teacher showing an animation of the Earth and the Sun and highlighting that the Earth is moving around the Sun, that her tilt is not changing, and that those things together mean the hemispheres change their rel relative position to the Sun. And she sums it up by saying, this is why we end up with opposite seasons, because of that tilt in our axis puts us in different positions in relationship to the Sun. And then she asks students to write one or two sentences that explain how the Earth and the Sun create season, seasons. And she plays the animation again while the students write for several minutes. And then she asks for some answers. The first student says, uh, the tilt of the Earth uh, on a 23.5 degree angle and the orbit around the Sun makes the Earth have seasons, which is to say that Earth's tilt and orbit lead to seasons, which does not include hemispheres or pointing towards or away from the Sun. And she says, it doesn't quite explain though why we get the different seasons. And then she gets two answers that provide what she's, uh, she's looking for. First, a student saying, um, uh, elaborates a bit more and says the, uh, the area facing the sun is different. So she's now, she's got towards or away from a student. And she said, who else is one? And then in the next answer on the side, another student, another student gives her basically that the, uh, the side that's tilted towards the sun basically brings in hemispheres as well as towards her away. And she likes that very much. So fantastic, I like that, that's a good one. All right, so the first answer added towards her away and the second answer added that and hemispheres. And once these responses complete the base constellation that she wanted, the base cluster, she moves on. So in other words, this third time through doing something different with a writing exercise and so on and then questions, um, has, brought, uh, has given us a different, sorry, has given us a different uh, route, has given us that route through. And then finally, finally, the final explanation is a summary spoken by the teacher. And now you should be able to follow along and see what nodes are brought into play. Earth's uh, tilt towards or away, differences in sunlight, um, and so on. Uh, striking the earth, different seasonal variations depending on how much the Earth is heated up during the day. Length of our day will depend on how far or north or so, uh, south you are from the equator, and so on. It explains why the temperatures over the year will change. Basically, in other words, 
this gets includes the base cluster, except the orbit, the, a bit of a sunlight angle route, and a bit of her daylight length route. It, it basically brings those three routes she's taken the class on together. It brings them together and gives a kind of composite explanation of everything. Okay, so let's just emphasize that we're not evaluating this teaching uh, and we're not evaluating the explanations. We're just exploring what it might tell us about relations among ideas. And in this example, explaining the seasons offers a variety of different pedagogic constellations, but different ways through this. When the teaching of the tides involved a base cluster that was successively elaborated, you add another thing in, you get some more implications. In contrast, the teaching of seasons involved, in this case, four different routes. I'm going to say, by the way, this teacher is superb. Um, the teaching it involves four different routes. It uh, involves what we call aggregate, separate clusters being brought together before she then brings them all together and combines them into one big composite. Okay. So to conclude, what we've been arguing, what we do in the paper is that relations among ideas matter. And the constellation analysis might offer us a way of seeing how they matter. And we'll just finish with four simple points, which is first, these two explanations do look at first pretty similar, but they're actually quite different when you look at it through this sort of thing. If we label their clusters as A, B, and C, then the, uh, the tides version has a kind of structure that you go, you go A, and then B, and then C. But the, the seasons has a structure that kind of goes, um, allows sort of A and or B and or C. So they have these different ways of being put together. Second, the teaching we explored seemed to reflect those in some way, shape, or form. They seem to reflect the logic of the explanations. Tides was enfolded in, um, tides was, uh, enfolded in a linear and successive clusters that built on previous clusters whilst the seasons allowed for these different routes to the explanation, the number of ways around the subway, the number of ways around the underground to reach the same destination. And third, this might offer us a way of getting re relations, by the way. This really simple, this is really simple analysis, but it actually might crack open something incredibly important, which is relations between research, curriculum, and pedagogy. This is the very thorny issue of recontextualization. We can start to see what that actually might mean. So recontextualization is basically kind of builds on Bernstein's ideas. And Bernstein, uh, LCT, like Bernstein, distinguishes between production fields that create new knowledge, recontextualizing fields that create curriculum and textbooks and things like that, and then reproduction fields that are sites of teaching and learning, like classrooms. And it says that each field has its own logics. And then when you move knowledge between those fields, you take stuff out, you take ideas out of an intellectual field, you turn them into a curriculum, or if you take a curriculum or a textbook and you use it in a classroom, it changes the log logic. It changes, it selects, it rearranges, assembles in different ways, put it together in different ways, it restructures. In other words, it recontextualizes the knowledge. And this is a really fundamental idea in Bernstein and then LCT, but there's actually very little light has been shed on how this works, how this is working in different ways. Constellation analysis might offer a way of analyzing how a set of ideas is structured one way in research, another way in a curriculum or a textbook, and another way in a classroom, and different ways in different classrooms. So we might be able to trace that by using constellations uh, in this way or other ways. And it also might suggest things like in science, uh, some constellations of ideas may be less amenable to resequencing than others. There might be a real reason why they're taught in a particular way. They might be just less open to restructuring and recontextualization. So finally, um, a couple of things. Constellation analysis might be actually practically useful for educators. I mean, we could use this instead of analyzing it, teachers could use this as a mapping, a way of mapping out lesson plans or teaching designs for the content to be taught and learned. Um, you could use constellation diagrams to make the knowledge being taught more explicit to students by highlighting key ideas and relations among them. You could use it to map progress through the sequencing of content and make visible how different issues come together. Or you could use it as a way of seeing how students are understanding what's going on. You can pair students' diagrams of, for example, an explanation of tides to the teacher's diagram and see which issues are missing, which factors might be missing, which nodes or links might be missing or misunderstood and need revisiting. And very, very finally, we can make some, uh, we made some very, very simple distinctions here between links and uh, clusters and ways of building is of course far more complex uh, than that. Links could be causal and sequential and 
associational and compositional and so we need to explore that a lot more but our aim was very very simple here to see if constellations might help show that relations among ideas might matter and the answer seems to be yes they seem to thank you thank you so much bro much time for your truly incredible presentation wow lots of clapping yeah, don't you just love zoom <laughs> online talks where you do it to the sound of absolute silence uh, people are listening <laughs> very no 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 no, no. This, it's just the way online works and by the way i'm used to it in most conferences anyway yeah. well. but but i'm sure many people look forward to the recording so so i think that's the advantage of an online conference and uh the recording <laughs> so thank you very much and it will be circulated widely later this conference and people can watch it at any time well, thank you so much for your presentation. And now it's time for question, everyone. And um, to expert here, so, oh, Carl, where are she? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, my, oh Mar Marco, yep, please go ahead. Yeah. Marco, yep, please, please ask a question. Uh, okay. Um, thank you so much for the interesting talk, Professor Nathan, and many thanks to Vincent as well. I think logical reasoning can be highly useful and it definitely ought to be taught uh, from a young age. Um, I also love logic because I'm into pragmatic dialectics and argumentation theory. However, a linear teaching method may not always be an effective tool when catering for students whose reasoning follows a more holistic or thematic uh, order. So how is this model, how can it be applied in uh, classrooms with a uh, naturally diverse student population? That's well, question. that's a question for every single type of pedagogy. And I mean, we didn't model how to, how to teach it. And we just suggested right at the end that this might have pedagogic implications. And that's it, um, rather than saying, this should be how it's taught or this is how to do it or whatever um uh, it's more of a case of um being a i mean like you could i mean the thing about these sorts of uh, lct tools is they can be used in almost every single way you can think of so for example you could lay out the entire thing or you can walk through it one by one so like it doesn't you know it kind of it's, it's completely available to being able to be used for a different kinds of ways through it you could show the whole thing you could work through parts whatever you could just you know lay it out it would be in the teacher's hands i'm a big believer in um in um in uh upskilling and and autonomy for teachers to be able to make professional judgments in the face of a very diverse and very complex set of variables that's you know that, that is the classroom with uh, all sorts of people in it and all sorts of different ways of uh dealing with all sorts of different kinds of knowledge so it's not a model of how to teach it's more a conjecture right at the end there to say hey this might be useful. Um, we're not sure yet exactly how, but it might be useful. Um, but it's certainly very flexible for how it can be used. The main point here, though, is the, the, the analysis of uh, the ideas of how they were taught and trying to figure out as a first step, why were they taught that way? So very little normative here, no normative. Just okay, to... thanks so much for that clarification. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question, Marco, and for the answer, uh, Professor Martin. And the next person, Puli, please. Vincent. Oh, there we go. This is the, the boy that's been causing me constant Vincent. irritation all the way through this talk. He's been barking and shouting. Anyway, sorry, carry on. Ask the question. Um, hi, Carl. I, I, I had such sympathy there with you. I, <clears throat> I have a dog here that does very similar things to me. If my sound had been on while you were talking, you wouldn't have been able to talk over the noise of my two going at each other. Anyway, yeah, so, I mean, it was more a comment, Carl. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think your um, <laughs> is the minute you talked about talking about a teacher reflecting on um, on, on the structure of, of what they were trying to teach, 
and um, yeah, and using it as a tool of recontextualization. I, that as a practitioner, that really resonated with me. I thought that yeah, I mean, particularly at the moment, I'm sometimes I find myself doing an explanation as a teacher, and I get lost in my own explanation. Mm. And what what would be great is to say to have thought about, yeah, the nodes I want to get across and to kind of um, plan those in advance. I want to touch these nodes and this is how I'm going to connect them. And you kind of have yourself a bit of a plan before you, I mean, obviously sometimes your explanations are going to be on the cuff, but thinking about planned explanations in the classroom so could be very powerful. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, as I said, it's, this is just one possible implication, and it's not like the reason why it was, you know, why we did this analysis or this research, and, and really is a sort of like potential possible kind of use that we haven't explored at all. But it's, I mean, LCT is about creating tools that empower people, um, rather than giving sort of, you know, uh, normative accounts of how teaching should be done. So there's a very strong distinction in LCT between the concepts and, con and the conjectures. So the concepts of the framework, like constellation, you know, and the methods, like constellation analysis as an analytical method, or constellations as a concept, um, are very much distinct in, in, from the way in which they're enacted to create conjectures about how we should teach or what is good teaching and so on. Uh, I'll give you a very brief example. Um, the concept of semantic waves the movements up and down and complexity and context dependence of knowledge is a concept. And then there's the hypothesis that semantic waves may help uh, knowledge build. Now that hypothesis might be proven wrong uh, and particularly in certain contexts because nothing tends to hold universally. So it might be the case that it's not the case that semantic waves is good. And it may in fact be the concept that proves that wrong and provides the basis for a better explanation. But the concept and the conjecture are separate. And the reason, I mean, they are related, obviously, studies and practice using LCT is very much related and feeds back into the conceptual framework. But holding that distinction in your head is quite important, I think, because I've read things like uh, someone saying, oh, LCT best practice is semantic waves. No, it's not. That's a conjecture about how teaching might be enhanced and you have to go out and try it and see what works. Um, it's the same thing here. These, these suggestions about how it might help us understand the written textualization, how it may be a tool potentially for educators and researchers, is very much a conjecture as to what might be useful. And the tools themselves will probably, will very much need to be sharpened up and used in different ways. Um, so yeah, it's very much a kind of like a fairly modest um, um, uh, aim in a sense. So here's a, Another way of thinking that might show that relations amongst these ideas matter. Now, that's really, really, I tried not to swear, it's really, really blooming obvious um, that relations among ideas matter, but I didn't give you the background because we didn't have time. Uh, if you look at uh, science education research, there's virtually nothing on relations among ideas. It's all uh, atomized stuff. It's all primitive, you know, um, uh sort of pro propositions and and so on and kind of like put together in a bag as if you can color you know if you get enough of these epistemological you know like p prims and things like that all these very primitive atomistic ideas you put them all together in a bag somehow you're going to get the explanation rather than paying close attention to the way in which these things come together so it seems damn obvious like semantic waves uh, is also obvious but um it might be a useful insight that's just what we're just saying in this paper What do you think, Jaegen? Jaegen is absolutely key to this paper, not just to me. I concur. You concur. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Doctor. <laughs> Coming at it initially from, um, in one sense, SFL. So the, the kind of my, my history on this part of the project was working with Carl on one strand and working with Jim Martin on another strand on the same data. And we kept coming back to basically the same thing that these two lessons in one sense were you know giving an explanation of everyday phenomena that were actually quite complex but they kept doing it in different ways and we had little sense from SFL or LCT at the time 
as to why they are different. And when we would then try to explain to each other tides or seasons, we found that we kept falling into different ways of explaining every time. It just, you know, I don't want to say it felt natural because that's not the way to go, but there was this push to explain in different ways. One very linearly, one a bit more all over the place in one sense. Um, and the question was, why? From an SFL genre perspective, they're both explanations in one sense, though, mm, though that was very loosey-goosey, uh, but why? And coming at it from SFL, what we developed with, with Jim was uh, try to understand a uh, model of field. Um, and then coming for, for LCT, we came at it from constellations. And in my mind, you know, the two of the two of them together kind of emphasize that that relationality is the key thing. It's not the kind of individual atomistic meanings, as Carl says. It's the relations between them. And it does seem to really force you to explain it in different ways. Um, and it's probably a hugely diverse number of um, kind of configurations and patterns in that regard. And we've just looked at two. Um, but you know, we don't know. We just want to take get a sense of how we could know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lily, um, you like to ask any other questions or the answer already satisfies you? Oh yeah, no, that's great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, are both of these papers in the book on explaining science? Teaching science, yeah. Oh, teaching science, yeah. Yes. Okay. No, another, available, reason, another reason now, to get it. Yes, now available in all good and evil bookstores. It, I know it sounds like, you know, a kind of real up yourself plug, but there is the, the book, consistently by all authors is is very good um, i was uh, you know us editing it we were very impressed by how all the authors pulled together so it's worthwhile but yeah that's a that's a weird self congratulatory plug yeah i was really yeah. impressed by that maiden chat who authored stuff he really was great right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a lively discussion. Um, I should say, I'm just going to add something into this, which is um, something I didn't really get a chance to say, which is that you can use, I mean, this, I, we've it sort of introduced constellation analysis in this way. This is a very, very simple way of doing it. There are many other ways of using constellation analysis. Don't think of it just as this. Um, this is just one way in. So, for example, I was just going to give you a little example here is a, um, uh, a diagram, a figure from Eleanor Lambrinos. PhD from 2020, which you can get from the OCT website, in which she uses constellation analysis to show how quite complex um, uh, constellations of words, gestures, and movements are brought together through the teaching of ballet. And this figure is a kind of you know condensed way of showing how a teacher teaches an exercise called springs by linking the instruction jump, which has already been condensed with meanings in a previous bit of teaching, it's been condensed with the meanings of powerful and straight legs and pointed toes and so on. And she links that to other things in this constellation to create like first feet in first position and arms by side and things like that uh, to, to, to get to this notion of um, springs. So you can use it as a way of showing, uh, mapping out how meanings are condensed into, into nodes and also then how those nodes are related to other things. It's a very flexible way of showing how ideas are brought together. So I think more than anything, constellation analysis offers a different way of looking at things. One of the things that revolutionized Bernstein's ideas and a huge leap forward was the use of planes, the use of Cartesian planes like that one, um, which is nowhere in Bernstein. And suddenly it freed us up to think in all sorts of different ways. And I think constellations is, is one of those sort of revolutionary leaps into really freeing up a different way of understanding the structuring of knowledge and the structuring of ideas and structuring of machine parts and people and so on that allows us a lot more flexibility than we understand this. And that's why I'm really excited about constellation analysis, of which this was only a tiny part. Andrew, please, thank you. Thank you, Professor Mayton, for, for the further explanation. Andrew, please ask some questions. Yeah, I will. Yeah, thanks, Vin. 
Hi, Carl. Great talk, uh, Jaegen and Carl. Just a question, and looking at this um, visual here from Elena Lambrinos's um, mm. thesis, with the nodes and the clusters, sort of when you get sort of um, break them down and look at them more closely, they begin to look like constellations as well. So looking at the jump on the right here. So the distinction in the terminology between cluster and constellation is that to do with sort of perspective and how closely you're looking at it and sort of unpacking it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's all, I mean, LCT has a, is, um, has a fantastic capacity to be used fractally, to be used at all kinds of levels. So, I mean, one of the questions I can ask when I do talks about, say, for example, semantics is in certain countries, it's the first question is, what is the use of analysis? And I go, mm, I don't give a shit. Um, it depends upon the object of study and the questions I'm asking. Nothing is, a, LCT is not a model of anything. It is a, a toolkit for, for addressing problem situations, objects of study and specific questions about the object of study. And you select from that toolkit and you put it together and you use it in the best way to understand that problem. So it is not a model of say knowledge or a model of social practices or anything like that. It's a toolkit for use. And so the, what is a cluster or a constellation is really um, very much dependent upon what you're looking at. It's a kind of useful distinction to say, look, this is gonna be part of something else. It's basically saying, look, this is a cluster and then it's gonna be part of something else, but I wanna retain this notion of it being a cluster. Or in this case, that would jump, that, that becomes a node. There's like a, a, a kind of cluster, kind of mini constellation that then kind of gets condensed down into a node, you know? I mean, it's like, it's, it is all, I mean, have you ever seen, uh, this is the, 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 an analogy that may not be of any use to, if you haven't seen Men in Black. Have you seen the film Men in Black, anybody? Uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, well, Men in Black, um, the, the, what is it? The secret of the universe or something? Is it the key to the universe? What is it called? Something like that? Something like that, the constellation on Orion's belt. It's on Orion's belt. Yes, exactly. And uh, spoiler alert for Men in Black, it turns out that an entire galaxy, the galaxy is on Orion's belt. The fate of the galaxy is on Orion's belt. It turns out an entire galaxy is inside a kind of marble on the, 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 the collar of a cat. And, and so you've got, you kind of then zoom in at the end of the film inside this marble, and there's an entire galaxy in there at a different level. So what's a galaxy or what's a, or what's a, you know, um, or not, you know, kind of like it comes down in these sense, in this sense to, to what level you're analyzing. In the same way that we can analyze codes at the level of an entire nation or a national curriculum or an entire planet or whatever it might be, or we can go down to the level of individual words. If we're looking at things like semantic density or semantic gravity. It's the same thing. We can we can say that you know this is a cluster and this is a part of a bigger constellation. Um, uh, it, they're really just tools for being able to say, hey, by the way, this cluster is going to be a part of something bigger. You know, usually a cluster is a part of something bigger. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, because it's not a model of anything, you could say you know, immediately one's brain might go, ah, oh, but everything's a part of something else. Yeah, of course it is. But we're that's if you're trying to model everything. LCT doesn't try to model everything. It says, here's the problem situation. And in that, this is a cluster, that's a constellation. You know, it's relativity. Yeah, great. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you. You have to free your mind to use LCT. That's the great thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Martin, and for the question. And few, any more questions, everyone? Emily, Emilia, Claire. Vincent. That's okay. I'll feed you in a minute. Any more questions? <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm learning, <laughs> so I don't have any question. 
That's okay. Well, I mean, I, I need to feed this dog anyway. It's a poor it's thing. So wonderful. It's so wonderful. So if you don't have any questions, so um, please let's thank Professor Maiton and uh, Dr. Dylan again for their wonderful contribution um, to the ESPLIT conference. And on behalf of the ESPLIT team, I would like to explain my half few gratitude to Professor Maiton and Dr. Dragon for their valuable support uh, for our uh, activities during the past two years. Thank you so much. And it's a wonderful end to the conference for Australia. So thank you very much, everyone, to all the great centers today and to all the chairs and to all the enthusiastic participants. Thank you so much again. Enjoy your evening and we'll be in touch again soon by email. Thank you very much, Vin. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.